majority of plots are either inherently mundane or inherently ridiculous, which means that if this is true for us, we don't necessarily have to worry about it in and of itself. Banality and the ludicrous also cling to most character actions, most emotions, and most philosophical discoveries. But we can't get away from it. The hard concrete of plot in fiction or of movement in poetry is almost inescapable. It forms itself inevitably, or we begin to form it as readers, even when it's hidden by the bad behavior, the needs, the lack of reason of the characters. So if we're going to work with the plot, which we may or may not want to do, we have the choice of trying to undercut its natural tendency to land at one end or the other of the ludicrous to banal spectrum, in which case we'd move it towards the middle, or else to embrace those tendencies and to find a way to use the possibilities of embodiment to make the ludicrous or the banal serve our larger purposes in the work. So I'm not voting here, as in everything one has a choice. One can say, this is ludicrous or banal, that makes sense, almost everything is, and I'm going to undercut it and make it less of one and move it towards the middle, or go all the way to the edges as far as you possibly can and see what you discover. A work might embody the irrationality of the emotions through deliberately improbable and dreamlike plot gymnastics. For example, this one king has kidnapped a rival queen by force, but somehow or other she falls madly in love with him, despite or because of this, and they can't wait to be married. Meanwhile, the kid of one of his best people won't marry the nice, well-bred guy her dad's picked out for her, but insists on a different nice, well-bred guy. Lovely dad says he'll have her killed or forced into a nunnery if she doesn't do what she wants. Meanwhile, the other nice, well-bred guy, the one she doesn't want to marry, has already made promises to a different girl, but he doesn't want her anymore and has made it really, really clear to her. <laughs> the lovers decide to run off together. Now they're in the woods in the middle of the night, where the royal fairies are battling over the fate of an adopted child. <laughs> While all this is going on, the girl the other nice, well-bred guy doesn't want, best friend of the first girl, tells on the runaway lovers to the boy she loves, then follows him into the woods as he's following the lovers into the woods. She throws herself at him and begs him to use her as his spaniel to spurn her, strike her, neglect her, and lose her, if only he will allow her to follow him. And that's before anyone has started to sprinkle the fairy juice. <laughs> with these characters, as with the mental patients I worked with and for in the last <laughs> to make up reasons for or stories about the meaning of their sometimes highly implausible actions, but anyone's true motivations may be opaque. And that was true for us, the staff, as well. As one patient said to me, the only difference between you and us, sweetheart, is those keys. <laughs> and I said, very true. Did you want me to unlock the cigarette machine for you? <laughs> In any case, both the workshop and semester supervisors will have a lot of questions about a piece, and some of these will need to be answered or dealt with in revision, but others are just going to be mysteries that want to be left mysterious. It's one of the challenges for a writer, getting information from workshop without feeling the need to then write a draft that explains everything and answers all questions. We might think of it as allowing necessary mysteries. Sometimes the, guide, the best guide as to when we're on the right track is when people are asking the questions of a work that we want them to be asking. While we can listen to everything our early readers say with interest, it's actually easier to take it in with some detachment when we realize that we don't have to do any of it unless it sparks our own ideas and resonates for it. We are the world's authority on our own work. <coughs> Going into the week, I think I might just say it again. We are the world's authority on our own work. The longer we work on a piece, the more it becomes clear to us which opacities or mistakes or gaps, places where we want and need to clarify what's happening or to add layers, and which opacities we consider strategic and choose to retain while embodying some other aspect of our work. We learn over time what we want to reveal, and we learn what secrets we want to keep. During our writing hours, just like my patient who had zero interest in being interrupted to join the mundane world of breakfast trays and morning meetings, we are all making our own worlds. In fiction workshops, at least, we do sometimes fall into asking what's at stake. But life and death, in their own ways, are each inherently states of emergency. So when the texture and momentum of a work convey this, we don't need explanations, and we don't necessarily need it to make any more sense than a dream. <laughs> 